Okay, thank you everybody for joining us for the um, for, for the first ECSS symposium of the year. So we got a couple of great, uh, great talks lined up. Um, Jeremy Fisher from Indiana University is going to be giving us an introduction to Jetstream 2. And that's going to be followed by Chris Martin and Julian Pistorius from University of Arizona talking about Exosphere, a user-friendly interface for research clouds. Um, as a reminder to everybody, this is an Exceed sponsored event. So we are governed by the Exceed Code of Conduct. And I'm going to paste this into the chat box one more time for those of you who joined a little bit later. Okay. Um, and before we get started, um, J Jeremy, for your talk, do you want to take um, quick questions throughout the presentation, or would you prefer that we wait till the end? I'd rather be interrupted and make sure questions get answered. Okay, sounds good. So if you have a question, please raise your hand um, using the raise hand feature or type your question into the chat box, and then I'll get um, J Jeremy's attention between slides so we can respond to them. So Jeremy, go ahead. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, okay. and you can take it away. I'm going to share my screen. Whoops, not desktop to PowerPoint. There we go. And I'm going to stop my video first. Oop. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Are you seeing my, just making sure we have, we're seeing the right set of things. <laughs> okay, let me drop my zoom over. All right, there we go. Um, so I am Jeremy Fisher. I am the uh, service provider rep for Jetstream. Uh, I wear a lot of hats with Jetstream, and I apologize that some of you will have seen a few of these slides already. Um, but today we're going to talk about uh, Jetstream, where we've been, what it what it's been doing. Uh, we're going to talk about Jetstream 2 coming. Um, today I'm the opening act for uh, Exosphere and the user experience. They're a great musical act. Um, so. Without further ado, we will jump into it. If you do have questions, please, again, do interrupt as we go. I'd rather make sure your questions get answered. Well, let's try that again. Okay, there we go. And because I am a student of uh, Jay Alameda, I have included our code of conduct slides. Um, and then there's also the terminology statement slide. Um, and all of these slides are available on the Jetstream website. I've already got them up in PDF form if you want to take a look at them later. So where we've been, uh, so Jetstream has been around uh, now since 2016 is when we went into early operations. Um, we're entering uh, yet another year of funding and Jetstream 1 will be running through November of this year. Uh, Jetstream 2 will be coming online hopefully around June of this year in early operations, so we'll have some nice overlap. But what is Jetstream? Um, why does it exist? Where have we been? Um, we are the National Science Foundation's first production cloud. Um, we're following that on with Jetstream. We're also seeing uh, some other NSF-funded clouds coming online uh, besides the, the Cloud Lab and Chameleon uh, uh, experimental clouds that predated us. Um, so it's we're, we're seeing more and more demand for services like this. Um, Jetstream in particular, uh, we focus on, on ease of use and, and making it easy for people to get online and get to science faster. Uh, we provide a pre-configured library of virtual machines. So basically, we try to have some very generic machines, whether they're just operating systems with uh, the compiler tools and things that people can build on to RStudio and Shiny, to Intel compilers, to MATLAB and things like that. So we, we like to make it so people can come on and get to work. Um, we are an uh, on-demand interactive resource. So uh, instead of being a typical HPC queued resource, you come in and you use it in real time. Uh, we also do host science gateways and things like that that are more persistent services. So it, it's really kind of a, a very broad uh, spread of, of people using the system. And what we like to say is it's programmable cyber infrastructure. So you can build what you need to get your work done. If you need a virtual cluster, we can do that. If you need uh, a Kubernetes uh, cluster, God forbid, you can do that too. Um, if you just need a single server, that's easy enough. Um, so we give people ways to basically build what they need to do to get their research done. Uh, the who, so this is what we'll, some of the things that will change as we go forward. Um, right now, Jetstream is one to 44 cores uh, for a VM. Um, 
it gives people a place to work that maybe they need to have full control. They want to have that root uh, access. Uh, maybe they're doing container development and want to have a, a clean environment to work from every time. Maybe they're doing uh, code or gateways or something that they really need to have a full control to that, uh, to that virtual machine. Um, and then one thing that's really near and dear to my heart is, is STEM educators wanting to teach. Uh, Jetstream has really found a great home for people doing online teaching. And as the past year has shown us, uh, having a, a means to do remote learning has <laughs> uh, been something we've all been after and, and it's been more crucial lately. So it gives a, a nice way that people aren't locked to on-campus facilities, that they aren't uh, locked down to uh, campus uh, compute uh, workstations and such. It gives people a, a very balanced way to work. So everybody can have the same environment. You don't have to worry about what notebook, what student has. Uh, everybody has the same environment to work from. So what we're not, uh, we're not traditional HPC. Um, there is no shared file system in terms of, uh, you know, a large luster scratch space. Um, we're, we're not high-end interconnect. So everything on Jetstream presently, and this will change in Jetstream too, but everything in Jetstream is ethernet based. Um, it's fast, but it's also, if you have things that are so timing critical that you need, you must have InfiniBand, then maybe it's not the right thing for you. Um, there are GPUs and, and uh, I say yet, um, Jetstream presently has a, a small number of GPUs available. They are not publicly visible. Uh, you have to contact us to get access to them. Um, it's not that we're trying to hide them. It's just been sort of a prototype for Jetstream 2 to get us some experience with it. That said, uh, we, we are inviting people that have a use, uh, a use case for it to talk to us and we can uh, get you access to it. Um, so we do have a, a probably about five or six, maybe seven uh, GPU uh, projects on Jetstream presently. And a couple of them are education based, which is really cool. We have uh, one group teaching using them. So. Um, so if you do have a use case for them, we can talk. Um, and then I like to say, you know, we're not Amazon, Azure, or Google Cloud. Um, we, we provide a subset of their services. We obviously don't have their budgets, um, we, but we provide some similar things. So folks that need basic virtual machine services, uh, need volume-based storage, or even object storage, these are things that we can accomplish. So the Jetstream 1 overview, this is what we looked like uh, since we went into production. So two production clouds, one at IU and one at TAC. Those two are identical. Um, they have 320 nodes each. Uh, then we have a small cluster at the University of Arizona that we use for development for our Atmosphere team. Uh, everything is interconnected with Internet 2, and then uh, ExceedNet is our, our sort of backup. So a little closer look um, at what we are. So there's several layers to Jetstream. So we have Atmosphere, uh, which is our, our web interface. Um, and that's, again, you know, we have our library of images. We basically want to use that to make it easy for people to get on. Um, we have OpenStack underneath, and that's what uh, the cloud operating system that everything is running on, uh, including Atmosphere, sits on top of this. And, and this gives all the tools for actually managing that environment from the user perspective as well. Um, KVM hypervisors underneath that is uh, providing the, the actual hypervisor access, uh, Ceph on the back end, and then uh, a variety of operating systems from the user perspective. Um, from the admin perspective, it's CentOS and Ubuntu, uh, and actually some Red Hat on the Ceph cluster itself. Um, and then uh, applications that the users bring. So it's a, a very wide array of things that are running on us. I, I have a breakdown that I do every year for the National Science Foundation, and it's pretty stunning how broad it is. And this is sort of a graphical representation of what we talked about. So you see at the top, uh, the web app and the user connected there, about 90% of our users come in through the Atmosphere web application. Um, and then the other 10% uh, come in through OpenStack. Now, if I could be standing in front of this, I would be pointing at things, and I would be pointing at the user coming in through OpenStack, et cetera. You'll just have to imagine that. Um, but again, 90% of our users coming in through Atmosphere, that's a, a pretty big thing. However, if you look at the actual usage breakdown, uh, it's only about 50% of our usage is on Atmosphere. So our, our power users are on the OpenStack side and they're the folks that are kind of doing some bigger, bigger things. Um, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, there'll be a range from, you know, infrastructure projects like gateways to folks that are doing uh, huge uh, elastic computing projects. We have a, a particular project uh, that at any given time, they might run up to, you know, uh, a couple thousand cores, which, you know, doesn't sound like much to HPC folks, 
But from a, a quad perspective, especially when your VM max VM size is 44 cores, it's quite a quite an undertaking. So they've uh, done some really interesting things to have elastic growth on their research, and they've been sharing that with other researchers too, which is even more cool. Uh, just a little look at the atmosphere interface. So. Atmosphere is going to go through a, a pretty big change uh, between Jetstream 1 and Jetstream 2. Um, I don't have any screenshots of the Jetstream 2 interface to show you, but uh, at this point, we can you can kind of see what the, the dashboard, sorry, that's the phone in the background. Um, you can see what the Atmosphere desktop looks like right now. So when you log in as a, a, an Atmosphere user, this is what you see. So API access to Jetstream um, using the OpenStack interface. Uh, some of the things we found out, so we weren't actually planning on providing API access until we'd been in production a year. Uh, literally the first day we opened up access, we had our first request to have API access. Um, so that made us really think about maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe we misstepped here and we got in a rush to kind of open things up. Um, so we, we, misunder, we, we misread the demand for that sort of thing, for the programmable cyber infrastructure. So we pivoted really quick and got people online. Uh, it led to some design decisions that we aren't really happy about, uh, such as those of you that have used Jetstream. When you log into the API side, everything is the TAC domain, whether you're using the IU cloud or the TAC cloud, because it was the TAC credentials that was feeding it. And that was something that, you know, in retrospect, we probably would have done that differently. Um, but that said, it led to a lot of great things. Um, it, it led to a lot of uh, educational opportunities where people are learning about cloud technologies and how to think cloudy, as we like to put it. Um, it led to a lot of people doing things that you know we had thought about, but we hadn't actually planned on being day one, uh, day one operations. So it was definitely a learning experience. Um, and, and we're very happy that people did because it's really kind of led to a lot of growth and a lot of science. Um, again, with API access, uh, we have the command line clients and Horizon dashboard uh, as means to access it. Um, now there's also uh, Exosphere as a means to access it, and uh, the, the fine gentlemen that follow me will be talking about that. Um, programmatic control. So if you would like to control things in, in a very programmatic way using Python, it gives you a means to do that uh, on the API side. Um, and then uh, has nothing to do with operations, but we give a means for, for API folks to talk to the support and, and operations folks via our Slack. And just a quick look at, you know, coming in through the API side, um, the CLI is all Python based. It reads everything from the environment. So you have an open RC file that uh, has a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense to most users, but it has things that uh, will identify you and put you in the right place. Um, Horizon can generate all this for you. Horizon does all this for you on the back end if you're using it. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have is, is making sure people get in the right project. So um, everything with OpenStack is, is, is project siloed. So you can't just pick up and move things from uh, allocation A into allocation B. It just doesn't work that simply. So there, mean, there are ways to do it, but it's, it's not simple. Uh, the Horizon interface. So Horizon is the GUI that the OpenStack project provides. Um, it allows you to do pretty much all the things you can do from the CLI. There are a few things that we found that it doesn't do. Um, the network visualizer is, is one of the things that uh, we actually use it a lot as a means to, of troubleshooting. It's uh, really cool to see. Uh, you can look at how people's uh, networks are set up and, and usually you can spot really quickly when something has gone kind of sideways. Um, and then as I note here, it, 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 I think it's easier to do security groups and Horizon just because uh, you can kind of see everything that came before you and kind of see it uh, without all of the screen uh, detritus, I guess. <laughs> um, the downsides is I find it maddeningly slow. Um, and, and that's where uh, the Exosphere folks are really gonna shine. Um, Exosphere is what Horizon ought to have been, in my opinion. Um, it's incredibly fast and kind of makes up for a lot of the things that are missing. So we'll see that as we go forward. Um, so now we're going to talk, look at a couple of our uh, use cases for Jetstream. Um, so you might have heard about uh, the, the, that black hole that they finally photographed. I don't know. Maybe you hadn't heard about. It. Anyway, um, so Jetstream didn't do. Jetstream wasn't part of the the final research for it, but we were part of the prototyping. Um, so a lot of the workflows that were designed 
at the outset were done on Jetstream and then were scaled up to Google Cloud because they just needed more resources than we could provide to them. Um, but it was really cool to be a part of that. Um, and, and we were all excited about that. Uh, a, a project our student RUs uh, did a couple years ago, um, they used GPUs and machine learning to basically identify fraud calls from audio. Um, so it was a really interesting thing to do that they, they figured out uh, how to use the machine learning aspects to figure out what species are in what areas based solely on recordings from field stations. So it was a, a really interesting project and actually a couple of the students have continued on with it um, and, and are really making some nice con contributions to science. Um, so it, it's a interesting use case of showing field stations feeding data back for analysis and that's something that uh, our, our folks at NC Gas have really uh, kind of push to, to do it and, and on other projects as well. It's really interesting. And then last, uh, as far as infrastructure projects, um, Brain Life is a gateway. Um, they are not just a gateway though, they run a couple of virtual clusters, actually four or five virtual clusters uh, between the two clouds. So they have a couple running on the IU cloud and a couple running on the TAC cloud uh, to do their, their mid-size processing. And then they also farm things out to both commercial cloud and HPC for doing larger scale processing. So it's a really interesting use of the hybrid cloud model of where they have a, a local presence to actually provide the interface. They have a local presence to provide modest uh, number crunching for the gateway. And then they have uh, an infrastructure to farm it out to do the large scale uh, number crunching that they might need to do. So it's really kind of the best of both worlds. And, and these folks have really done some amazing things over the last few years. And then uh, last but Jeremy, not least. Actually, yes, before we go on, can, um, we have a couple of questions that came in. Sure, absolutely. OK, so this is from Kapil Agarwal. Ag Agarwal. Um, what tools are you using? and deploying OpenStack? And how are you managing OpenStack upgrades? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> um, so in terms of, of managing OpenStack itself, our engineers are using SALT uh, for the most part. Uh, TAC is using Ansible to some degree. But on the back end, most things are being done with SALT. Um, as far as upgrades, uh, IU Cloud and TAC Cloud are handling it a little different. Um, so IU Cloud has had no maintenance updates where we've taken everything offline. Um, we, we've had some outages, you know, from uh, we had a power outage uh, a few months ago. In fact, the whole campus had a power outage. It was fantastic. Um, and, and we've had some network outages where, you know, people didn't call before they dug up our fiber, which was also fantastic. Uh, but for the most part, the IU Cloud has basically stayed up. And what happens is uh, our admins will come through and drain hypervisors one by one uh, doing live migrations and then update that hypervisor and put it back into the queue, drain the next one, do the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. So they'll run through the nodes, through the 300 nodes. Um, you know, it's not one by one because it's automated with salt, but it will go through and drain them one by one, move everything out, do all the upgrades they need to do, and then bring it back into service. So it's been, uh, we've been really pleased with that. Um, it, it's been very stable and reasonably fast. Next. Was there another, Bob? Sorry, right, we actually had one more question that just came in. Um, this is from uh, Madhu Gujral. Um, will there be equivalent for Amazon S3 bucket to upload data for Jetstream 2? Um, yes, there is actually an object store now. Um, it is only available from the API side. Um, it is very, very much beta. Um, we do have users using it. In fact, BrainLife is one of, uh, one of the users kind of using it uh, on a larger scale. Um, we're going to bring it to the forefront with Jetstream 2. It's not just going to be kind of a, a stapled on sidecar service. Um, the problem right now is with Jetstream 1, um, since it is only available from the API side, making it accessible via atmosphere is not very easy. Um, it can be done, but it's, it's one of those things that since we're in our final, you know, 10 months or so of, of operations, we're kind of focusing more on adding the features to Jetstream 2 and not Jetstream 1. So yes, there, there will be an object store available with Jetstream 2. Great, thanks, Jeremy. That, that was all the questions. Okay. 
Um, and then our, our, the last use case I'm going to touch on before talking about Jetstream or about, uh, you know, a kind of a wrap up and fade into Jetstream 2 is a, an education uh, use case. And Unidata uh, in 2020 and actually in 2021, it, it, they finished this last week, I believe, uh, did a workshop for AMS. And they had at the 2021, they had 127 uh, users working with them. Um, and they used a uh, Kubernetes cluster that was an auto scaling cluster. Um, so they it jumped up to, to meet their needs. Um, everything worked pretty flawlessly for them. Um, I believe uh, Andrea Zonka had worked with them as well. Uh, so he, if you have questions about how they did it, he would probably know a little bit more than I do. But uh, Unidata has had success with this and, and they're one of our power users. So uh, they've been pretty pleased with the service. I talked to, to uh, our contact there and he said uh, they had no technical glitches this year for AMS. So um, my guess is other than just the 100% remote access uh, versus having people in a room might have been their stumbling block, but he said from a technical pers perspective, everything went well. But this is something we also very much encourage with Jetstream is the educational aspect where everybody can, it, it sort of democratizes resources where everybody has the same starting point. So as we found what worked and what didn't work, um, uh, allowing API access and full control, uh, having root privileges, being able to control everything about your virtual machines. That was something that people have been very pleased with. Um, people can run continuously. You know, we don't, once you get your allocation, you can burn it over the course of the year. You can burn it all at once. You know, we really don't put any limitations on that. Um, and you can keep running as long as you renew. And so we've had allocations that have been running since we came online in 2016. Um, we have folks that come on for a year at a time just to do very, very specific research and then they're done. Um, but what we found is that people are very pleased with the fact that, you know, they don't have to wait for queue times. They can just run whenever they want to and however they want to. Um, the other thing was trial allocation. So we add almost, a, almost one trial account per day um, and it gives people kind of a taste test. So they get a few thousand core hours, uh, not a whole lot. Uh, they are very limited in the size. They can only run uh, small VMs, uh, but they can kind of see whether or not this will fit for their research. So um, it, it makes it really nice. Uh, what didn't work? So forcing smaller allocations into the research allocations process. And this isn't really a Jetstream issue so much as, uh, as working with Exceed. Um, it's more of, uh, you know, for folks that are new to the national cyber infrastructure, and that was our one of our uh, aims given to us by the National Science Foundation is to bring new people into the, the national CI, um, making them write uh, a, a five to 10 page grant proposal for what is essentially a startup allocation uh, didn't sit so well. So fortunately, Exceed has kind of changed their, changed their view on that. And basically anything that's of a smaller size, now they can just renew, which is nice. Um, Multi-year allocations, uh, all of our gateway folks, and basically most folks with longer running grants were hoping for, the, for a multi-year allocation. And that's something that, again, Exceed is working on. So we're, we're pleased with the progress there. Um, and then the last is something that we really, uh, this, this is a Jetstream problem, which is a lack of shared data set storage. So one of the downsides uh, with how our grant was funded is one grant was turned into two grants. And Bridges was funded out of that as well. And what NSF told us to sacrifice was storage. So we've been a little bit short on storage since we began. And that's something that is will be remedied in Jetstream 2. All right. Here, Jeremy, we just had a couple more questions come in. Sure. Um, this is from Emily Rugg. Mm -hmm. um, where can we find the costs and Jetstream service menu? In, in the sense of, uh, of, of SUs or, I mean, I, 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 we're, we are uh, so, <laughs> so, so I, think, I think we can answer the first part because the costs are, there, there are no costs. Yeah, we, it's already we are. paid for with the NSF. But, but Emily, did you want to go ahead and, um, and, and. I guess I was just curious. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, and thank you for this. This is so exciting. I, I was just curious if, so, um, you just set up an account or you have to apply or how does it work if there's no cost and then and then what does um, how do you how does the user find out what they have access to it's just in terms of the the capabilities of the system rather than any 
uh, like if there's a science gateway that you can access or something like that. Right. Um, so you get an allocation via Exceed. I'm going to put our wiki uh, address into the chat. Um, so one, that's all our documentation. Um, there's also a, a page there for getting an Exceed allocation for Jetstream. It walks you through the process, um, everything from getting getting an Exceed account to applying for a startup account. Um, you can get between 50 to 100,000 credit hours or core hours uh, for a startup. Uh, like I said, no cost. Um, and it should only take you, I tell people and applying for a startup, if it, if it takes you more than about 10 to 15 minutes to get that, something has gone very, very wrong. Um, <laughs> And then once you have that, you can kind of explore our interface. You can look at our documentation now and, and get a pretty good idea of what's available. Um, you can also, uh, we have on our website, I believe there are uh, some science nuggets where you can kind of see some of the, uh, some of the more interesting projects that have been happening over the last few years and more novel projects, I guess would be a better way of saying it. Um, so I think that would, uh, yeah, that'll, that'll work. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, I saw Blake had said, is there a way to test Jetstream before getting a startup allocation? Yes. Um, so you can get a, a trial allocation, uh, which is available. There's a big button on our website. And then if you log into the Exceed user portal and scroll down uh, to the left, just under like where you have your user information block, uh, you can enroll in the trial allocation and you get a thousand core hours, uh, like I said, limited to two core VMs, but at least you can try it out and, and check things out. Okay, so I'm at, uh, let's skip, okay. Well, skip your question then, I can do that. Um. <laughs> and, and Jeremy, actually we had a couple other questions. These came oh. in directly to me. Um, okay. Again, from Kapil Agrawal. Um, what ML2 mechanism driver are you using? OBS or Linux bridge? Uh, oh, for, uh, for the uh, networking underneath Linux bridge. Okay, and second question was, what does your OpenStack provider network look like? flat or VLAN based or something else? It is VLAN, but to get into those technical details, I would probably refer you to uh, one of our engineers. Um, I, I'm, I'm a Unix admin, um, but I am not an OpenStack admin. So uh, if, if you want to reach out to me after, uh, let me put my email. Uh, there we go. Uh, so I put my email in the chat. So reach out to me directly and I'll hook you up with, uh, with our lead engineer. Um, we also have a Slack that uh, we pretty much, anytime we encounter somebody running an academic cloud, uh, research cloud, we add them to a Slack that it's, it's not a, a, an Exceed Slack or a Jetstream Slack. It's just a whole bunch of uh, OpenStack admins that run research clouds. And it's a great place to, to talk shop. Okay. I know, I know we're running real close on time. So, uh, if there aren't other questions, I'm going to slide through the Jetstream 2 slides real quick so you can get to Exosphere because that's that's why you guys are really here. I, I was just, I'm just the opening band. All right, so here's a quick look at Jetstream 2. So you saw Jetstream 1 was was uh, two clouds basically of equal size. This time around, we have the primary cloud at IU uh, for 416 nodes. Its core count is a whole lot more. Um, plus 90 nodes of, of GPUs, uh, 360 GPUs will be present, a whole lot more storage this time. Um, and then we have the regional system. So we have our partners at Hawaii, Arizona State, TAC, and Cornell uh, will all have smaller uh, compute facilities at their sites. And these will be sort of test beds for doing uh, cloud integration and, and moving back and forth between the different regions and, and for building more. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be an interesting way to do things for, as a way of sandboxing, as a way of growing clouds. Um, we're, we're looking forward to, to seeing how this works out. Uh, some, some more of the conceptual architecture of, of how you use Jetstream. So uh, for Jetstream 2, again, we'll have atmosphere in some form or fashion. We'll have horizon. Um, of course, the, the CLIs will be present. And then third-party applications. So that's something that is we didn't focus on from the start. So where we say third party, third party applications, um, we kind of came at this specifically thinking about Exosphere. Um, so we've known the Exosphere guys for a while. Uh, we, we think they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty good at what they do. And we definitely like the things they're doing. So uh, they kind of opened the door to having something that maybe wasn't uh, 
directly funded by Jetstream, but as a, another means of controlling OpenStack clouds. And as you'll see when they do their, their uh, slides and walkthrough, it's pretty amazing. I, I'm, I'm taken with it and I really honestly can't say enough good things about it and they're not paying me to say that. So, so what improvements are planned? Um, again, uh, we're looking at a bunch of key things. So the object store, which isn't on this slide is something that's gonna be exposed uh, to more users. Higher level orchestration. So making orchestration a first class user and not just something that's for power users. Um, push button virtual clusters. Again, that's something that we're looking at uh, and almost have uh, completed now. So you can roll out a Swarm cluster that can integrate with pretty much any other HPC just by doing uh, your queues and, and configuration correctly. Um, Federating Jupyter Hubs um, and the implementation of Jupyter Hubs, again, as a push button service. Um, shared application service. So basically, instead of having a whole bunch of different images, it'll kind of be in the same sense of an HPC machine where you can just launch a generic VM and load up anything that we have in our software library. So you need MATLAB and you need Shiny and you need R and you need Intel compilers uh, or you know whatever. You can just module load them or whatever. We haven't actually settled on our, our design yet, but uh, uh, it's probably gonna be some form of modules, uh, I'm guessing Elmod. Uh, but you can just load up what you need onto your VM from a shared application store. Um, and then again, approved storage. So that's the biggest thing. So object storage is on here. <laughs> I forgot and that, was, that is on here, but also having uh, shared storage between VMs is something that people have been asking for since day one as well. Um, and making that uh, again, a push button easy service and not just something for advanced users. Um, again, programmable cyber infrastructure, making that a first class service. Um, so using things like Terraform um, is going to be a focus and we're gonna have, hopefully have nice documentation for that to help people move back and forth between Jetstream and commercial clouds and on-prem clouds, et cetera. Um, container support is gonna be a first class citizen. So again, making that so it's in the forefront and that users can use it easily and readily and you don't have to be a power user to get to it. Um, we have planned collaborations with commercial clouds. So those are things that are already in the works. Um, They're outlined here. So we have, we've worked with the, the three major providers on various aspects of, of interoperation. Um, and then uh, GPU access, both interactive and for uh, longer running workloads. So those are things that we really see uh, as big changes going forward. And we're in the design stages on that now. So where can I get help? Again, I put the wiki in the chat a few minutes ago, but here it is again. Um, that is our up-to-date information. It is mirrored to the portal, but we kind of lag behind on the portal a lot of times. We, we update it first in our wiki and then the portal folks come along and work with us on making sure it gets updated everywhere. But we definitely advocate going to the wiki first. Uh, we have a CLI tutorial up that I wrote. Uh, we have user guides. And then of course, help at exceed.org if you have questions and that gets into our help queue. Um, I did see that container registry question. I'm, I'm trying to studiously ignore it. No, I'll get there in a second. Um, so our acknowledgements, our Jetstream partners for Jetstream 1, that's NASCAR slide 1 and NASCAR slide 2. And we are at the end of the slide. So let's see. Um, so the container plans, a local to Jetstream container registry. That's something we're talking about, um, you know, especially with the changes that Docker Hub has done with uh, you can only do so many pools and, and whatnot. The problem will come down to uh, what my colleagues at Exosphere call space junk and making sure things get cleaned up and don't just uh, fill up space into, uh, you know, into perpetuity. Um, it's something we're looking at. I, I don't have a good answer for that today. Um, will, the AMS, will the AMS use case now be easier with Jetstream 2? Oh, you mean uh, uh, the scaling, scaling things up, Jay? Yes, yes, Jeremy. Okay, um, yes. Uh, so part of bringing uh, a, a Kubernetes Jupyter Hub uh, set up to the forefront will definitely play into that. So that is what AMS is doing is, is it's a, uh, I have to credit Andre Zonka because he, he did the uh, zero to Jupyter Hub on Jetstream and really just made it so easy for people to, to read and digest. Um, I can't say enough fantastic things about him. He's been uh, fantastic to work with. Um, but 
yeah, it, it will it will make things like that much easier going forward, with, especially with Jetstream 2. It'll be exposed to the user and a first class citizen instead of a power user activity. Thank you, Jeremy. That that was fantastic. Um, we went a little bit over, so we're gonna um, switch gears. So jo Julian, I mean, and um, and Chris are gonna take over. So Jeremy, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing. And Julian, are you so? Are you going to be driving the slides? And Chris is um, going to be. We're I'm we're both going to talk. And I'll be, yeah, Chris is talking and I'll be driving and we'll switch back and forth. So just double checking that people can see my uh, screen here. Yep, yep, we're seeing your screen. Excellent. Yeah, and just, Chris, can folks hear me all right? Yep, yep, you sound good. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you too. Cool. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm playing a bit blind over here. This is Chris Martin. And uh, it, it looks like they're not allowing me to join Zoom from my web browser, and I can't install the desktop client. So uh, we will try to make this go smoothly. Um, Julian, uh, go ahead. Uh, we're good from yep. here. Yep. So CMO, for context, uh, we are on the first slide. I use HPC. What can research, research clouds do for me? Great. OK. Uh, so welcome. Um, good morning. Uh, we're presenting Exosphere. It's a researcher friendly interface for cloud computing. You probably heard Jeremy sing our praises. Uh, he's very kind. Thank you. Uh, we're, uh, we're in this business to help researchers and we're, uh, we built Exosphere as, as, as part of that mission. And so if you could type your questions in the Zoom chat so that we can get through the presentation quickly, we'll take all the answers at the end. Thank you very much. So uh, my name is Julian Pistorius. I work as a research computing engineer at the Depart at the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at the University of Arizona. Before this, I worked at Cybers for three years, building and supporting the Atmosphere Cloud product that Jeremy mentioned, um, which is the uh, easy-to-use user interface for cloud computing. And that Cybers Atmosphere Services based on it, as well as Jet, uh, Jetstream's user interface. Uh, I was also one of the co-founders of Research Bazaar Arizona, or RaiseBaz, you might have heard of, along with Blake Joyce, who's also on this call. Uh, and we have taught and volunteered at a number of workshops for research computation and cyber infrastructure. So, CMOT, go for it. Sure. So, um, my name is Chris Martin. Uh, username is CMART everywhere, so people call me that sometimes. I started Exosphere with Julian and have built it over the past three years. Um, it started as a spare time project and now it's between a half and a full time job. I also used to work for Cybers at University of Arizona for three years as a software engineer and sysadmin, uh, building and managing research clouds with OpenStack, Ceph, and other technologies. I contributed to Atmosphere, which was the initial user interface for Jetstream and uh, still is the official one. And uh, I also built the Jetstream test environment uh, cloud at U of A. Um, so let's jump right in. Um, I'm assuming, stop me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming we're still on the slide with the table. Uh, what can research clouds do for me? I think yep. Jeremy did a great job of hitting on most of these points, so I will try to go quickly. Uh, so there, there are four characteristics here where we think that research clouds can really help folks out. And commercial clouds like AWS can, can also do this, but, um, but they, uh, they cost money for researchers to use. And we have these great resources like Jetstream 2, which are available more or less free of, free of cost to researchers. So, so this applies broadly, but is, is particular to clouds like Jetstream. Uh, so latency, um, we, we have a cloud instance or a virtual server that you launch. It takes uh, a few minutes, usually between five and 10, uh, to become ready. But once it's ready, uh, it's ready to do any work that you give it right away. We don't have to wait in a batch scheduled queue for your job to execute. So we have a faster tweak test cycle time. And this, this meets the human attention span. You're not, you're not submitting a job and waiting 10 minutes and going to get coffee and then coming back before it even starts. Um, so if you're developing, if you're, if you're exploring or iterating on a model or an analysis, then you can possibly uh, build that a lot faster um, and a lot more smoothly um, on, on cloud computing. Uh, persistence, so an HPC job, depending on where you're running it, uh, usually lasts a few days at most. 
a cloud instance can run for up to multiple years as long as you need it. So if you are creating a science gateway, which I think is a fancy word for a science website, or a repository for your data or metadata, or a work queue manager, which sends jobs to HPC systems, then a research cloud is, uh, is going to be the best place to do that. Um, you, uh, things that can run for minutes or for years, um, but the cloud itself doesn't really care as long as you have the allocation for it. Uh, elasticity, so clouds allow you to resize your running workload on demand with no loss of progress. Um, OpenStack has this live resize feature and other platforms do as well. Uh, compared to an HPC job where you, if you find that you haven't allocated it enough resources, enough cores, RAM, storage, whatever, you have to cancel that job typically and resubmit it. Uh, so if your workload is uh, sporadic or your demand for resources is difficult to predict, uh, you, might, uh, you might have an easier time running that on a research cloud. Uh, finally, flexibility of runtime environment. On clouds, you get root access. You can do whatever you want with the kernel, with the system package manager. Uh, like Jeremy said, any software tool chain or workflow. So if you're exploring new analyses, new visualization techniques, and you want to put together new pieces of software that no one's done before, uh, you have maximum flexibility on the research cloud. Okay, uh, back to Julian to introduce Exosphere now that we have a bit of context. Okay. So uh, the first question usually is, is like, well, that sounds great. Uh, how do I use it? And as Jeremy mentioned, Horizon is the a built-in user interface for OpenStack, but it is notoriously difficult to use. It was built for uh, sysadmins, for sysadmins. And we learned from Cyvers that it, there are better ways of doing this. So we decided to build uh, Exosphere as a user-friendly alternative for OpenStack cloud systems. And our aim is to close the accessibility gap between the power of research clouds and the adoption of researcher-friendly interfaces for them. Our aim is that Exosphere will do for research clouds what Open On Demand has done for HPC. You might have used that before. It's a nice, easy to use interface for HPC systems. We would like something like that for cloud computing. And uh, something that else is a little bit different from something like Atmosphere and Horizon is that Exosphere is a pure client application. Um, it has no backend services or databases. This was a, a deliberate choice uh, in order to make it easier for system operators to deploy. Uh, because we adding more maintenance and upkeep uh, is not something that uh, already cash strapped cloud operators are really want to deal with. And so it's a pure client application. It can be deployed on the desktop or in a browser just with static HTML and JavaScript on something like GitHub pages. It is also very easy to create your own custom theme. Something that we recently introduced was that being able to introduce institutional branding and your name, logo, and things like that. And finally, Exosphere is completely open source. It has an open community-driven development process. You can check it out at the uh, links that we'll paste lo um, later. So we engage with user community and have from the very beginning to ensure that we are solving your actual problems. So I will now do the demo so that you can see what it looks like. Seema, was there anything else I needed to cover? Uh, I think that's good. Um, do you want me to narrate the demo while you drive it? Um, sure. Or do you yeah. want yeah. to narrate? OK. You go for it. Great. So uh, I will be flying blind here. Uh, I can't see <laughs> Julian's screen. So Julian, please, please stop me if I'm talking about uh, if I'm going too fast. I'll do. Um, I, I will assume that we are now on try.exosphere.app, and um, we are on the login screen. So if you click Add Project in the left-hand column, uh, we'll see choose yes. a login method. Great. So uh, for Jetstream Cloud users, we've streamlined this a little bit, although more streamlining remains to be done. So if we click Add a Jetstream Cloud account, it will talk you through getting your TAC username and TAC password. Uh, like Jeremy said, this is uh, this is suboptimal, and for Jetstream 2, actually sooner than that, uh, this this will be simpler. Um, people can log in with their Exceed credentials using OpenID Connect via Globus. Um, that feature will probably land in a month or so, uh, maybe sooner. But for now, uh, we have you jump through a couple of hoops 
um, hopefully this this historic this is historical legacy that will be streamlined very soon. Um, but the upshot is that you type in a username and password and you get access to both regions of Jetstream Cloud. If we click Add Project again, uh, go back and click Add OpenStack Account. And uh, we should see uh, add an OpenStack account. So you can either uh, enter credentials for whatever OpenStack-based research cloud you have access to here, or paste an OpenRC file, which contains all of those credentials in one blob, click login, and it will add that account to the Exosphere interface. So on the left-hand column, you can see uh, in, this, in this navigation pane, you can see all the clouds that we're logged into right now. And I'm guessing at, at least we have uh, the IU and TAC regions of Jetstream Cloud. And we also have Tombstone Cloud, which is hosted at Cybers at the University of Arizona. Julian, you still have, with um, me? Yes, and we also have NACI. <clears throat> yes, uh, the New Zealand eScience Infrastructure. So here, here we have uh, four different OpenStack regions across three different research clouds maintained by three different organizations uh, on two different continents and hemispheres, all uh, managed with the same user-friendly interface. Um, so you don't, you don't have to learn a different interface for each one of these uh, that, that you do work on. That, that's at least our goal and our dream, um, even if it's sometimes not quite perfect. So, uh, Julian, if we click on the IU region of Jetstream Cloud, we should see about four different servers there. Yep. Great. So let's go to High ECSS. Uh, this is one that I created yesterday. Yep. Uh, cool. Uh, actually, let's let's launch a server so that we can talk while it deploys because we take a few minutes. So, um, in the upper right, if we go create server. Mm -hmm. And it will ask us to choose an image. Uh, if we type JS-API in the search box, uh, we'll see we can, we can launch a virtual server or an instance from a whole bunch of different operating systems. Some of these uh, have pre-configured uh, scientific workflows. Some of these are set up with like MATLAB or NVIDIA drivers. Uh, for now, let's choose a plain old Ubuntu 20, which should be about the fourth one down because I know that this one will launch quickly. Yes, it's a vigorously moving ocelot. All right, so we have, an, we have an auto-generated auto name, which we'll hopefully replace with something relevant, but we can leave it for now. Um, we get to choose a size for our instance, and this will uh, determine how much compute resources we have access to. Uh, we get to choose, so let's choose small there, um, one dot small. We get mm -hmm. to choose a root disk size. Um, we can either use the default or we can have a volume back server. Uh, this allows us to set up a larger root disk if we are installing a lot of software or if we know that we're dealing with large data sets. Uh, we can crank that up as high as we need, uh, at least within the limits of our quota. And finally, we have a slider where we can uh, choose a quantity of servers. So if you're running uh, different experiments in parallel, uh, if you are creating a virtual cluster with worker nodes, this lets you create a bunch of servers at a time. Uh, we have some advanced options that I will gloss over because um, this, is, <laughs> this is not an advanced presentation. Uh, very, in very short, um, folks can modify the, the boot script more or less that provisions the server. They can deploy SSH key pairs if, if you're a power user. But for now, let's hide those and just click the Create button. And we should be taken back to the server list view. And in a moment, we should see our new server uh, at the building. It looks like we're launching two of them. Uh, so while those are building, let's open up the high ECSS server again because that one's already ready. We can talk about it and show you some uh, show you some features. Uh, Julian, are we there? Yes, we're on high ECSS. ECSS. Great, great. So we can see the server is ready. Um, we have, among other things, uh, we have a floating IP address here. So this this is just a server on the internet. Uh, you can, you can, if you set up like a web server on it, you can access it at that IP address. 
you can assign a host name, you can, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, we can attach a volume here. So this allows us to provision more storage on demand. Um, these are kind of like giant USB flash drives in the sky or in the cloud rather. Uh, we also have these interactions. Uh, so Julian, if you click on web terminal, that should bring up uh, a nice user-friendly shell. Let me know if you get there. It's loading. I'm on a VPN from another continent. So <laughs> here we go, connected to Guacamole, uh, waiting for response. Yep, it's loaded. Great. So uh, this, is, this is just a shell. Uh, you don't need to worry about SSH key pairs, port forwarding, firewall rules, anything like that. You click a button, you get a shell. Julian, if you type sudo su, uh, folks will see that we have full root access to this virtual machine. Yep. And also, if, uh, so if Julian presses control alt shift, we will see a sidebar. Let me know if you're there. Oh, it might be different on my computer. Um, so uh, ah. th let's just say that uh, Iron is also. Control command shift perhaps on a Mac. <laughs> the salute is not working on Firefox for me. So uh, we'll just skip past this. I should have used Chrome anyway. Nope, no problem. Um, so uh, if Julian were in a different browser, we would be seeing a graphical file uploader downloader that allows us to easily get data in and out of this virtual machine. You just select files in the file system to upload or download. Um, we, should, uh, we should probably make that a bit more straightforward for folks on Firefox on Mac, but uh, moving I, along for the moment. Yeah, I did just demonstrate uh, the simple copy and paste using the cursor. So. Uh, yeah, yep. so copy and paste works. Uh, so this, this is a technology that already exists in Jetstream 1. Um, it will also exist in Jetstream 2 on Exosphere. And we will also support uh, graphical desktop environments in a similar way. Uh, so Julian, if we go back to Exosphere, uh, the interaction section, let me know if you're there. I'm there. Great. So we have uh, native SSH, again, for power users. If you want to just connect this way, you can click the copy button. Uh, you can log in with a password that's auto-generated by Exosphere. So Julian, if you click the show password button, we will see a long, terrible, ugly auto-generated password. But you can just copy and paste that into your terminal and get an SSH session. Uh, finally, we have a console. So this, this is, again, a power user feature for troubleshooting. If your network is offline, you need to troubleshoot it. This, uh, and this may not work because I, I broke it last night. Um, but, but this lets you, <laughs> it's like plugging a monitor and keyboard into your computer. Um, anyway, uh, so going back up to the actions section, um, we can run all of these actions on a server. Uh, we can click the lock button. So if we have multiple collaborators sharing the same allocation, this prevents uh, one of your colleagues from accidentally deleting your server. Um, we can shelve our server when we're done working with it to conserve our allocation and resources on the cloud. Uh, we can delete it when we're done. Um, below that, we also have these uh, system resource usage graphs. So these show us how busy our server is. Uh, we have uh, CPU memory and root file system usage. So this helps for troubleshooting. If the server is unresponsive, we can see if it's working hard. Um, we can see like, oh, maybe it's time to resize the server because it consumed all of its memory or something like that. Okay, uh, why don't we check on the servers that we just created? So Julian, if you navigate back to the server list view uh, and look at our vigorously moving ocelots. So it looks like one of two is, is ready. Great. So like I said, it's typically about five or 10 minutes. And the time it takes depends on how recent the system image is. Because the very first thing we do is install, uh, we install operating system updates. Uh, from whatever the distro vendor is. So in this case, it would be from Ubuntu because we want to make sure we're on the very latest security patches. And if the image is more than a few weeks old, sometimes that takes a few minutes. If it's a recent image and it doesn't have much to do, it's, it's ready pretty much right away. 
Um, but if we go to vigorously moving ocelot one of two, uh, we will see that uh, it's ready to go. And um, everything that I showed you uh, on the other server is also true here. And we have, we have that boot volume attached there. Right. Okay. Um, I think that's that's about all I dare demo right now while I'm <laughs> while I'm flying blind. <laughs> Julian, would you like to talk about our architecture? Yep. Okay, so uh, I'll briefly go through the architecture notes. And so, as I mentioned, uh, Exosphere is a client application, and it's uh, static HTML and JavaScript that talks directly to the OpenStack APIs. Uh, you can see the compute service here, the storage service, and the network service. These are the APIs that OpenStack surfaces in order to provide this infrastructure as a service buzzword <laughs> capability. And the uh, other things that we use are this cloud cores proxy and the user application proxy, which allows the browser to talk to uh, APIs securely without system administrators having to con uh, configure anything or users having to worry about securing their applications like Jupyter Hub, etc. The uh, Something we'd like to mention is that Elm is uh, a programming language that we are using to write Exosphere in. It is a uh, it's a programming language. It's a pure functional programming language with static types in the same venerable family as Haskell and OCaml. Uh, Elm is compiled directly to JavaScript and HTML, and uh, thanks to the Elm static type system, it guarantees zero runtime exceptions. And this was very important for us in order to maintain. Uh, excellent user experience, as well as a high quality code base in the long term. Then the next thing is, is we've also recently implemented, as I mentioned, white label uh, capability, which means that in order to provide a customized version of, of Exosphere, like this one for Jetstream, uh, a single JSON text file is all that's required to set the, the logo, some help settings, uh, how to get support, the uh, colors and things like that. So you can see that it looks similar to this, but just different in slightly different ways. So if you want to talk about our future plans. Sure. Uh, so do we have the slide up called Exosphere's Future? We do now. <laughs> Great. So um, th this is like the one or two, maybe three year view, uh, depending, depending on funding, interest, and community uh, feedback. We will integrate with data science workbenches, uh, first off uh, Jupyter Lab, and then probably our studio, and then maybe others. Uh, so back in the in the Exosphere user interface, where I showed you those interactions, we are imagining these data science workbenches to just become more interactions, where you click a button and it says open Jupyter uh, Jupyter Lab. And that opens right up in your browser. Um, this is easy and straightforward for us to build. We just have to do it. Um, the idea is uh, when you launch a new server, these data science workbenches can be selected. So you can say, you know, I want an RStudio server with this one, or maybe maybe it even installs by default. Um, and uh, and that's super easy to get going. Su super easy to experiment with. Uh, next, GPU accelerated streaming desktop environments. So um, I'm really surprised no, no one has done this yet in the sort of research cyber infrastructure space. You can do this on AWS if you put it together yourself. Um, but there's, there's no like push button receive uh, GPU back streaming desktops. Um, this surprises me in, in the age of sort of streaming GPU back gaming services, which are now pretty popular. Um, it's really no different for us to do that. So, um, so th this is something we'll build for Jetstream and other providers as well. Uh, moving quickly, because we've got to finish up, supporting more of the OpenStack API, um, community curated recipes for reproducible workflows, uh, single sign-on and credential lease. We're using things like CI logon and Globus. Uh, support for public clouds like AWS, um, Right now, we're not doing this at all, but we could. Uh, workshop specific features. Um, happy to talk about more of this offline. Um, finally, uh, our call to action. I'll send it to Julian to wrap up. So uh, we'd uh, really just like you to uh, kick it around, uh, use it with Jetstream or your own research cloud. Uh, let us know if you need demo access to Jetstream or other clouds. Uh, you can visit us on GitLab. This is the URL. We will share these slides afterwards. 
uh, if there's something missing there, please send us an issue. And you can always chat with us in real time on uh, Matrix or on Gitter, and our email address is there. We would just like to acknowledge Jetstream Cloud and Indiana use of university for their ongoing support and also Cybers at the University of Arizona, our friends and ex-teammates there for hosting our services. And so there are some questions there. We are at the top of the hour and I don't know how, um, how many people would like to talk. So I'll leave it to Bob, to see if there's any time for questions. Thank you very thank, much. Thank, thank, thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you, um, Julian. I can't believe you two pulled that off like that. Um, Chris, that, that was a fantastic pivot. That's like me driving blindfolded. My, my wife says, look out for that truck and there's a stop sign ahead. So excellent job. That was great. Um, for those of you who want to stick around, I think we have time for one question. Um, this is from Capil Agarwal again. And it's kind of a long question. So Julian, if you just want to go ahead and read that in the chat. I can read it. Yes. Okay. So Kapil writes, so the end user who wishes to interact with OpenStack via API slash programmatically, how does Exosphere fit in there? Does Exosphere expose the API itself or does it proxy API requests to endpoints or do users directly interact with endpoints and bypass Exosphere? Excellent question. And uh, I think that would be a really good point to, introduce, to actually add to any future slides we do, because uh, it is the very last one. Users directly interact with the endpoints and bypass Exosphere. But unlike uh, Atmosphere, Exosphere tries to get out of the way when you're interacting with your uh, compute resources via other means. You can switch back and forth between Exosphere, Horizon, which is the default user interface, or the command line interface slash API. And sometimes it's just really easy to see the status of something in Exosphere. And sometimes you need to script something, in which case dealing directly with the Python libraries and the API or the command line is the more efficient way to do things. But we wanted to be able to allow people to have the friendly user interface experience when they need it, but graduate to be able to do this programmable cyber infrastructure that uh, Matt Vaughan talks about. So you can go back and forth and potentially graduate to dealing directly with the API if you need to. We are just calling the API as you would from the OpenStack Python library. And there's no magic, we're doing no magic. So, and you can actually look at the browser. Uh, if you look at the browser developer console, for example, uh, and you refreshed here, you might be able to see here, like we are talking to the proxy here, you can see all the, 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 the things that we do behind the scenes are things that you would see um, if you were to look at what the uh, Python command line tools do as well. So it's a good way to learn how to actually drive these APIs yourself. Thank you for that question, Kapil. Okay, so that looks like the last of our questions. Um, th thank you again so much to all of our speakers, to, to Jeremy, to, to Julian and Chris. Um, we will get the slides posted shortly and the um, video, we usually get those up in a couple of days. So thank you again, Beth, thanks for coming to our first ECSS Symposium of the year and hope to see you all in February. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Bob. It was great. Uh, thank you. Thank Jill. you, Bob. Oh, you're welcome. Pleasure. Thank you.